Well, that was quite the sunset, would you not say? I want to thank uh, the Christian Truther channel for that. That's a video that's um, going around Facebook and purportedly is of a sunset down in Brazil. Um, that's pretty bizarre. But this video is about what exactly is helium-3 and helium-4. When I first got tuned to all this, like probably most of you, it was like, okay, uh, what the hell is helium? I mean, I know what helium is. All of us do. It's the uh, funny gas that you put in balloons, and if you inhale it, you know, we all end up talking like uh, Donald Duck and Mickey Mouse. So, yeah. Uh, but, you know, I come to find out, folks, there's a lot more to this. Um, fact, a whole lot more. Let me just give you a brief definition of helium-3 and helium-4. Helium-3 called HE3, is a light, non-radioactive isotope of helium with two protons and one neutron. Its presence is rare on Earth, but it is sought after the use in nuclear fusion research. It also is used in MRI scanners and in sensors to detect smuggled plutonium. H3 is gas that is that has the potential to be used as a fuel in future nuclear fusion power plants. There is very little helium-3 available on Earth. However, there are thought to be significant supplies on the moon. Several governments have subsequently signaled their intentions to go to the moon to mine helium-3 as a fuel supply. Such plans may come to fruition within the next two or three decades and trigger a new space race. To provide a little background and without getting deeply into the science, all nuclear power plants use a nuclear reaction to produce heat. This is used to turn water into steam that then drives the turbines to produce electricity. Current nuclear power plants have nuclear fusion, fission, excuse me, fission reactors in which uranium nuclei are split apart. This releases energy but also radioactivity and spent nuclear fuel that is repossessed into uranium, plutonium, and radioactive waste, which has to be safely stored effectively indefinitely. Okay. Well, isn't that just uh, exciting? And there's fact there's more to that, but let's talk about helium-4. It is a non-radioisotope of the element helium. It is by far the most abundant of the two natural occurring isotopes of helium, making up about 99.99986%. Did y'all get that? 0.99986%. There'll be a test on this later. Of the helium on Earth, its nucleus is identical to an alpha particle, and consists of two protons and two neutrons. Alpha decay of heavy elements in the Earth crust is the source of most naturally occurring helium-4 on Earth. While it is also produced by nuclear fusion in stars, most helium-4 in the Sun and in the universe is thought to have been produced by the Big Bang and is referred to as the primordial helium. However, Primordial helium-4 is largely absent from the Earth, having escaped during the high temperature phase of Earth's formation. Radioactive decay from other elements is the source of most of the helium-4 found on Earth, produced after the planet cooled and solidified. Helium-4 makes up about one quarter of the ordinary matter in the universe by mass, which, with almost all of the rest being hydrogen. Okay, so I trust you were keeping your notes. So let's get to some real basics here, right? Let's get back into the periodic table. We all remember this probably from eighth or ninth grade, maybe sooner. Um, so once you understand where helium stands in 
the periodic table of elements, then you can begin to understand that there are nine isotopes of helium with different numbers of the neutrons, stable and unstable. And as you can see here, we have a representation of helium-2 through helium-10. All right, each has its own atomic weight. Picking this up now? Now, remember radioactivity. The alpha, the helium-4 nucleus, beta, fast-moving electrons, gamma, high energy, no mass. Got it? So when we look at this to go through the review again, second most abundant element in the universe, but not on Earth, liquefied helium has cryogenic properties, very important, and is used to freeze biological materials for long-term storage and later use. 20% of industrial helium, helium use is in welding. Protects the heated parts of materials such as aluminum and titanium from air. So, it's also used in tanks for underwater breathing devices. Now, it can be measured as we can measure neutron energy. And as you can see here, we can bring out different aspects of it, right? This is how we know what's in the stars. This is how we know what the sun is producing. And it's how we get an idea of what other planets are made of, other stars, other solar systems, etc. You get the point. So, again, the uses of helium, it's everywhere. I mean, good God. I mean, I thought, you know, at first that this stuff was rare, but you find it's in everything. It's used in balloons, you know, uh, as we talked about, neon lights, extremely low temperature, cheap uh, superconductivity. Um, it's used for diving and uh, in uh, shielding gas and welding. Uh, again, chirogenics used to cool superconducting uh, magnets. Uh, for MRIs. I've had those. I'm sure many of you had. Pressurized and purge systems of unwanted gas. So you can see that the the uses of it just are everywhere. And we see this every day in our lives. So you can see here how the fusion together with the deuterium and the tritanium to release vast amounts of energy. You know, I was beginning to think that, you know, if you could mine this H3, wow, you'd have, in fact, I've actually read somewhere today that they are going to use it as the uh, energy propellant to do interplanetary and potentially uh, inner uh, space travel. So we know. This is how uh, Todd also found that they began to see that there was detection uh, because we do have detectors. All right, for the guys with the math and the gals, here you go. Um, you can do your own formulas on it. Some fast, fun facts of helium-3. It's a light, again, non-radioactive isotope. You know, we see the atomic mass of it. And again, we see what it's used. In fact, if we didn't have H3, I doubt seriously we would have the technology we have today. Um, again, I'll just run through these. These are great little facts just to begin to get yourself orientated to what this element is. I mean, it's out there. It's all around us. We're in a cloud of it, apparently. So I thought, well, gee, we all need to have an understanding. And there is some real strategic applications on this H3, H3 folks. It, there really is. Uh, as I began to do it, I said, well, isn't this interesting? So here are some, this recounting on the helium. By the way, this is an actual particle taken from CERN. Isn't that cool? Now, think about this. Helium-3 in fusion, not fission, fusion, energy. Folks, there is a lot here going on. I am not smart enough to even begin to be qualified. I have a right, just like you do, to go do a channel and you could talk your mind. And, you know, it's what people are interested. We'll have a good discussion. And I do this because it helps me to learn, too.
So if I have an understanding what the science is, and I don't need a PhD, we have one already. <laughs> and I'm sure there'll be more information to come to help explain this for us. But understand that there is a difference between helium-3 and helium-4, but they all have to do, don't think for a second, with energy. And it's everywhere, folks. I was surprised to begin to see how we can actually measure it. And you can see right here, we can get H1, H2, H3, H4. And you can see how they can actually now track it, graft it, and pack it. So understand again, gamma ray, protons, neutrons. So we understand this. I think the real thing about it is it can be apparently very unstable. Oh, well, okay. We're floating in this stuff? You know, is it the is Earth kind of like collecting dust? Are we like collecting H3? Is it somehow another ionizing? Now, we talked about the Big Bang, right? I happen to be a big fan of the Big Bang Theory. So, folks, this has, it's, it's amazing how it is all connected, right? Helium. So, follow the breadcrumbs. So, we have the Big Bang, beginning of time. We begin to go through here. Looking up here, folks, the helium nucleus and the helium atom. We wouldn't be here if it wasn't for that. And apparently in the formation of stars, it apparently is uh, quite abundant. Um, it's used in star formation, used in generating uh, electrical power. It's, it's everywhere. Now, I don't know if this cloud is something to be concerned about or not. From my little bit, and I do say poquito, uh, is, hey, this has got some interesting el uh, elements to it. Hmm, I could see why powers to be would be very interested um, in finding out or maybe already knowing. So I have this thought, I was talking to John today, and it occurred to us, I said, well, imagine this. What if we're moving into a region of space? Because remember, our universe is constantly moving. What if we're moving into an area of space that is dominated, say, by a red giant that has what well, we don't know could have multiple brown dwarfs? You know, there was an episode on Star Trek The Next Generation where they were coming back, Picard and Geordi, and they, and they got themselves into a, a minefield of where time stopped or time slowed down. What if we're in an area of space that has been in a region that was the result of a large red giant supernova? I don't know. Could we be impacting in that? Is it us that it's impacting the system instead of the system impacting us? Don't know. But I think it's very obvious that when you look at the life of stars, that this very could have something to do with this cloud we're in. And I'm just speculating here. Uh, I'm putting this out there. I'm giving you the information so that you could see it as well. Because it's very obvious that in the evolution of stars, there is a heavy element of helium-3. Helium. I mean, there's a lot of other elements as well. You, you can't just see it. But so... This is what really got me. The uses for helium-3, and you know what? They know, folks. They know. They've mapped the moon out. They know exactly where the highest concentrations are of the he uh, helium-3. I have a thought here. Could there be a correlation with the UFO activity that has been documented to the production of helium-3? Could our moon possibly be a satellite that is a repository of abundance of this element, H3? 
Could it be that that's why we see UFO activity up there all the time? We seem to see areas that seem to be mining. We know that the Chinese are already up there with their uh, rovers. So, you know, as I'm thinking about this, maybe the powers to be don't see this as a bad thing. I mean, here, India has already staked the claim, saying that it's their future of their energy. So it's obvious just in the production of energy and how it has a direct correlation to technology and the manufacturing of technology, could it be that we may be now in an area of space abundantly rich in this element? And I don't know what it has on the ecology and the ecosystem into bioforms. I have no idea, but I do know this. There are plenty of much smarter people who are aware of this. And I think they have maybe figured it out. Who knows? Maybe ET has done this. So a little homework before I close here. So, Helium has two natural occurring isotopes, helium-3 and helium-4. The atomic mass of helium is 4.003, right? Which isotope is more abundant in nature? All right, folks, be kind to one another. But I really do like to give you some thought about this on the moon. You know, listen, if there was a more advanced species than mankind, homo sapiens, and they're already doing interplanetary, interstellar space travel. And if they have found an element that is absolutely required, and now they're aware that we're aware, I don't know, something to think about.